Welcome to our weekly worship service. This is Peace Evangelical and Reformed Church in Potter, Wisconsin, a non-denominational Christian church. I'm Pastor Mark. It's a blessing to be able to um, have worship. And today we'll be in 1 Thessalonians 5 and talking about how to find the good stuff, how to sort out a true message from God from a counterfeit message from God. And as always, our worship services are Sunday mornings at 9 o'clock. We have Sunday school for students of all ages beginning at 10 o'clock and Bible studies during the course of the week. And everybody's encouraged and invited and warmly welcome to participate. And we trust and pray that the Lord will give you something to chew on as we worship him today. Let's pray. God, we thank you that we can have this space for worshiping you. We dedicate this whole time to you and give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, welcome to PC Evangelical and Reformed Church. It's wonderful to see you. And I'm Pastor Mark. It's an honor to be able to begin the week with worship. I have a few announcements to highlight as we get into this morning's service. We have Al Willems of the Gideons here. He's going to show a brief video and presentation of the Gideons ministry and the you could direct offerings or the loose offering that goes to the Gideon Bible distribution ministry here this morning. Some birthdays to announce. October 22nd is Theo Geiger's birthday. October 23rd, Gerald Hoyer. And this Saturday, it'll be Christine Furman's birthday. So happy birthday. Okay. Um, we have a anniversary today. Wynn and Vera Casper are celebrating their 40th wedding anniversary. Happy anniversary. <laughs> And then October 22nd, Fuzzy and Kathy Weeding have their anniversary. And on Saturday, Daniel and Jamie Weeding. So happy anniversary. <laughs> okay. 
see the beautiful flowers on the altar. They have been given in memory of Brian Mertz from the Mertz family. And that's what the flowers there are for. And also, you know, for, I think for the second week, these are um, roses um, in memory of Laverna Hilgendorf. It would have been her birthday, I believe, last week. And this is from her family. And let's see, and the flowers in front of the podium are in honor of Win and Vera Casper's 40th wedding anniversary from Jim and Sandy and Penny and their families. So thank you so much. They are beautiful. Uh, do we have any other announcements to highlight as we begin our worship service? Well, then, this concludes our morning announcements, and may the Lord add his blessing to our service today. Father, we thank you and praise you for this time of togetherness. We dedicate it to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together, and we'll sing number 318, Wonderful Grace of Jesus. Oh, blue is for the guys and the red is for the ladies. Okay.
was good singing, even without the last verse up there. Amen. That was awesome. It was really good. Good filling in the blanks. <laughs> we'll remain standing for the reciting of the Apostles' Creed found in the back of the songbook on the right side and also on the screen. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the one holy universal Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. We have a special music presentation from the Potter's Clay.
that was beautiful. The kids can come up for the children's message. Good morning. Look at all this money I got this morning. <laughs> How many of you think that you could tell the difference between the real money and the phony money? Okay, Kaylee, which one's the real money? This one, how'd you know? You are right, by the way. Does this one look more like real money? Yeah, Kaylee was able to tell the difference because she knows what the real one looks like. So that she could tell right away that these have to be fake. And that, that's the way we need to be with the Bible. We need to know the Bible so well that if somebody says something that's wrong, we'll know right away that it is fake. It's very important that we do that. Just like we can do it with money, we need to do it with the messages that people say, whether or not they're right or wrong, if they match up with the Bible. <laughs> Let's have a prayer. And God, I, I thank you that, that the kids already can tell the difference between real money and play money. Help us to be that way with truth, that we can tell the difference between truth and a lie, the truth and the counterfeit. In Jesus' name, amen. Involved in drugs while I was in dental school, thinking that I could do both, be a graduate student by day and doing drugs and partying. Well, this whole time, my parents, they had been a Christian for several years now and just had really grown in their faith. My parents, uh, knew the only way they would be able to see me since I wanted nothing to do with them. They actually flew, flew down to Atlanta one time and after the second day I kicked them out. But my dad, he wanted to give me something and it was his very first Bible and he left it on my kitchen counter. But as soon as they left, I took his Bible and I threw it in the trash can. My mom prayed that God would do whatever it takes to bring this prodigal son to the father. Well, this miracle, this answer to prayer came one day with a bang on my door I opened up my door and on my front doorstep were 12 federal drug enforcement agents, Atlanta police, and two big German shepherd dogs. I just received a large shipment of drugs and they confiscated all my money and my drugs and I was charged with a street value equivalent of 9.1 tons of marijuana. I was walking around the cell block and I passed by this garbage can and as I looked at that garbage can, I felt like I was looking at my own life. And I was about to pass by that garbage can but something on top of the trash caught my eye. I bent over and I picked it up and it was a Gideon's New Testament. I took that New Testament back to my cell and for the very first time, I opened up that New Testament and I read through the entire Gospel of Mark. And as I know today, what we have in our Bibles is not just ink on paper, but what we have in our Bibles is the very breath of God and it's living and powerful and sharper than any double-edged sword. And as I began to read God's word, it began to penetrate me and it began to cut through my stubborn, hard heart. He revealed his plan for my life and he called me in full-time ministry while I was in prison. So the greatest miracle of this whole story is that actually Moody accepted me. I was released from prison in July of 2001 and I started the very next month. I'm teaching now back at Moody in the Bible department. So I tell people I went from prisoner to professor. Only God can do that. Ladies and gentlemen, Al Willems from the Gideon Ministry. I've never gotten a round of applause before, thank you. <laughs> the Gideons are active in 198 countries. Last year, we distributed more than 80 million scriptures and Bibles throughout the world. The Bibles are distributed in all the traffic lanes of life, hospitals, doctor's offices, clinics, pregnancy crisis centers, domestic abuse centers, hotels, motels, jails, to the military. In fact, we even did a distribution here a couple of days ago, right, Hermie? 
We were the best Western hotel over in Chilton. We distributed 50 scriptures, 50 Bibles, full Bibles. Um, Gary Schultz, I don't know how many of you folks know him. He's a member of our ministry. He was out at a parade in Brilliant distributing the Life Book. The Life Book is a CD-sized book that the Gideons sponsor. We finance it. It's a book that's given to free of charge to pastors and youth pastors to distribute within, within the school walls. It's peer-to-peer -peer distribution, student-to-student -student distribution within our schools. Uh, my wife and another lady were involved, and they did a distribution in Brilliant this, within the last six months to all the doctors, uh, clinics, and different clinics. So although we are worldwide, and we're in 100 and what did I say, 196, 198 countries, we're also here in Calumet County. Today, I'm going to ask you folks for three things. The first thing I'm going to ask you is to help us fund scriptures. You can do that in several different ways. I notice you have a card rack out and back. That's one way. Use the Gideon cards. Give Bibles in, in memorials of people to celebrate different events. Do that. That funding comes to us. We purchase scriptures with that. Another way is we're going to take a collection today. But we have a new program, a new program that's called the Friends of the Gideons. If, the second thing I'm going to ask is become a member. But if you're not, if you don't have the time, if you don't feel like you can make that commitment, we have a new program called the Friends of the Gideons. You can come alongside of us and support us both financially and through prayer. There's two different steps in the program. If you become a financial partner, you'll partner with us each and every month to help support the ministry. If you become a prayer partner, that's a person who's just, not just, the person who's going to pray for us and pray for our ministry and pray over those seeds that we plant. Okay, the second thing is to consider becoming a member of the Gideons. We have a couple of guys in here. Ron Vanden Bogart is an active member. Hermie's been an active member. In fact, he, I'm filling his place hope that he's done this for many years. But consider that, because that's where our members come from. I also want to mention one other thing about the financial side of it. The monies that you give will go directly towards the placement and purchase of scriptures. All the money for administration for the Gideons is paid for by the dues of our members. So when you become a member, you help to pay for those things. The third thing I'm going to ask is the most important. And the third thing is that you would pray for our ministry. I noticed out in back that you have a, um, what would it be, a quilt or that, that shows the seeds. And it says it's been, you've been planting seeds for 125 years. Well, God has given us a great opportunity. He said to the disciples, he said, you will do greater things than this. And one of those greater things is to pray. Your prayers water the seeds that we plant. Okay? What a great privilege. God could do it without our prayers, but he chooses not to. He chooses to use our prayers to water those seeds that are planted, the ones in Chilton, the ones when Gary handed out the life book here in Brilliant. The ones where my wife and another lady put in the clinic. So those seeds get watered. And if they find fertile soil, they grow. They grow into people's new lives, which is what the Gideons are all about. We, our, our mission statement is to win men, women, boys, and girls to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ through the distribution of God's word and personal testimony. That's what we do. And you people partner with us. Not only worldwide, but you partner with us here. Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. You folks are our partners. You are our brothers, our sisters. I thank you, and I thank you, Pastor, for the time today. Thank you, Adam. Our Bible lesson comes from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 19 through 22. Do not put out the Spirit's fire. Do not treat prophecies with contempt. Test everything. Hold on to the good. Avoid every kind of evil. 
This is the word of the Lord, and may the Lord add his blessing to the reading and proclamation of the word of God. And Father, we thank you for the scriptures, and we pray now that, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart would be faithful to the scriptures. In Jesus' name, amen. Federal agents are trained to distinguish real money from the counterfeit money. They study the genuine bills until they master the look of the real thing. They become so familiar with the real money that they can instantly spot something that's counterfeit. That's the way we need to be with the Bible. We need to become so familiar with the truth of God that we instantly spot the counterfeit. That we instantly know whether or not something is of God or if it's not of God. I want to talk today about how we can do that. Instead of putting out the Spirit's fire by treating prophecies with contempt, we're going to talk about testing everything we hear and seeing if what we hear lines up with the Word of God. Today's message is called, Finding the Good Stuff. In 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 16 through 18, it talks about what we should say to God while waiting for Christ's return. Rejoice, pray, give thanks. But beginning in verse 19, it's about discovering what God says to us while we wait for Christ's return. And in verse 19, he says, do not put out the Spirit's fire. Imagine a cool October evening. evening. You're camping at the park, warming yourself over a crackling fire, watching while the fire consumes the sticks and the twigs and the paper and the wood. In about 20 minutes, the fire starts to subside. Somebody gets up. You say to yourself, good, he's going to keep the fire burning so I'll be able to get warm again. But instead, he takes dirt and dumps it on the fire. You say, well, that's the last time I'm going to go camping with you. While the fire was burning, I felt warm and wonderful. Now I feel cold and uncomfortable. And Paul is saying, I don't want that to happen to your congregation. I don't want you to put out the Spirit's fire so that your congregation becomes cold and uncomfortable and unfriendly. One way we keep the fires burning at Peace Church is by singing with enthusiasm. Don't you love the way we sing here at Peace Evangelical and Reformed Church? Wonderful the matchless grace of Jesus Deeper than the mighty rolling sea, higher than a mountain, sparkling like a fountain. I love it when we sing songs like that with all of our heart. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Psalm 33, verse 1 says, Sing joyfully to the Lord, you righteous. It is fitting for the upright to praise Him. But another way we keep the fires burning is by warmly welcoming worshipers. Somebody told me that one of the things I love about Peace Church is that you people seem to like each other in this congregation. <laughs> yeah, instead of making a beeline for the exit the second the service is over, you guys hang out and talk with each other for 15 minutes or 20 minutes or 25 minutes. I think that's the way it ought to be. I think that's what it means to encourage one another and serve one another and pray for each other. But Paul says there's one other important thing that you don't want to overlook if you want to keep the fires burning. Verse 20, he says, do not put out the Spirit's fire. Do not treat prophecies with contempt. You need to be a church that hears the truth, heeds the truth, holds on to the truth, and cherishes the truth. Often, when we hear the word prophecy, we think about spiritual weather forecasting, telling what's going to happen in the future and focusing on that. Sometimes there is a futuristic element with prophecy. How do I know that? Jesus says in Mark 10, verse 33, we are going up to Jerusalem and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will hand him over to the Gentiles and condemn him to death. They will mock him and spit on him, flog him, kill him. Three days later, he will rise again. That is a prophetic word about the passion and resurrection of the Christ. But John R. W. Stott points out that a prophecy need not always be about the future. 
It is simply a direct word of God to his people. It could be about the past, it could be about the present, or it could be about the future. It could incorporate elements of all three. What makes us nervous is when people spend so much time trying to figure out the day and the hour of what's going to happen in the future instead of focusing on what Jesus wants them to do right now. They're so focused on later on that they're not thinking about today, what God wants them to do. And you have every right to be concerned about an extreme position such as that. There was a book years ago by Edgar Wissonette called 88 Reasons Why the Rapture Will Happen in 1988. How many of you remember when that book was popular? Okay, a couple of you do. Well, when that prophecy failed to come true, he was undaunted. He came out with a revised edition, 89 Reasons Why the Rapture Will Happen in 1989. I'm serious. <laughs> and when that didn't come true, he came out with 92 Reasons Why the Rapture Will Happen in 1992. And finally, in 2001, he just gave up. <laughs> finally figured out we don't know the day or the hour, neither the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father, Mark 13, 32. More recently, Harold Camping predicted that the end of the world would happen in May of 2012. Well, when that didn't happen, he was undaunted. He said the rapture of the church is going to happen in October of 2012. But instead of us getting taken up to be with God, he's the one that got taken up to be with God because he died. <laughs> you know, you've got to be careful about that stuff. False prophets like that give authentic biblical prophecy a bad reputation. But authentic, genuine prophecy does three things. Number one, it strengthens the saints. How do I know that? 1 Corinthians 14.3 says, Everyone who prophesies speaks to men for their encouragement, strengthening, and comfort. I have a prophetic word for the church right now. God knows your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. He knows about all the work you did for the Gospel Fest. He knows about your love for the Bible, your ministry to the kids, your generosity toward missions, and your love for one another. But make sure that you are not doing these things in your own strength. Make sure you are fully relying on God. Make sure that you are even more committed to prayer than you are already. That is a prophetic word from God for our congregation. Number two, prophecy gives instruction to the church. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14, 19, I would rather speak five intelligible words to instruct others than 10,000 words speaking in tongues. Dr. Ben Witherington says the entire fifth chapter of 1 Thessalonians is a prophetic word from God instructing us how to live for Christ in the meantime while we wait for the end time. Number three, prophecy challenges people to turn from their sin and turn back to God. How many of you think it's a good thing to turn from your sin and turn back to God? In Jonah 3, verse 4, Jonah approaches the people of Nineveh, and he gives what in Hebrew is a five-word sermon. Forty more days, and Nineveh will be overturned. And the people said, oh no, we're not ready for that. We're in trouble. And the entire community got down on their knees in dust and ashes and repented of their sin before God. Even the king of Nineveh himself got down off his throne and he tore his robes and sat down in the dust and ashes and got right with God. And Jonah 3 verse 10 says that when God saw what the people did, he relented and did not bring upon them the disaster he had threatened. A prophetic word challenges people to turn from their sin and turn to him. Last month, I was on YouTube getting information about the movie God's Not Dead. And there were a lot of posters posting messages on the internet making fun of the movie, mocking God, insulting Jesus Christ, and speaking about Christians as if they were the most pitiable people on the planet. Normally, I ignore 
the bottom dwellers on the internet and try not to get sucked into a theological debate with people that just want to debate. But in this particular instance, I felt incensed and indignant and inspired by the Spirit. And so I was led by God to post a reply. I said, you will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every careless word you have spoken, for by your words ye shall be justified, and by your words you shall be condemned. Fourteen people gave me a thumbs up on Google+. <laughs> but at least 14 others made comments to me that would have made my hair curl if I had hair. <laughs> But I felt like I did what God was telling me to do. I mean, I didn't tell him I was quoting from Matthew 12, verses 36 to 37. But I was guided by God to give a prophetic word of warning. You need to take what God says seriously. And, that, and that's what Paul is saying to us here. That if you want to keep the Spirit's fire burning in your church, do not Ignore the word of God. Do not treat prophecies with contempt. When you hear a challenging message from God, you should say, Lord, help me to repent of any sin I need to repent of. Help me to do whatever it is you're calling me to do. Help me to minister to whoever you're calling me to minister to. Help me to bless whoever you need me to bless. But some Thessalonians were nervous about allowing prophecy in the church. They were saying, we have to take a stand and not allow this stuff because what if a pagan prophet from a false god walks in off the street and says something and we end up believing the wrong message from the wrong god? We're farther ahead not allowing anybody to say anything at all and just shut ourselves off from everything. And Paul's saying in verse 21, don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. We need to take a more balanced approach when it comes to the prophetic word. Test everything. Hold on to the good. The Greek word for test is used to describe somebody who examines silver to see if it's genuine silver. And it's also used to decide what's worth holding on to and what's worth throwing out. It's sort of like when you go out to Famous Dave's Barbecue Ribs. When you order the barbecue ribs, you're not going to eat the bones and leave the meat behind, I hope. You're going to judicious, judiciously decide, I want the meat, and I'm going to get rid of the bones. And we have to do that in life. We have to figure out what the meat is and get rid of the bones. We need to hold on to the good stuff. There was a Methodist pastor in North Carolina in 2011 who read the controversial book by Rob Bell, Love Wins. And he said to his church, I just read this book, and I want you to know that my theology is starting to mature. I now believe that love always wins. Everybody has a place in the eternal life to come. Eventually, everybody will be saved and there is no hell. Well, you know what the congregation did the next day? They gave it to him. <laughs> they said, you're fired! And then there was an article in the March 25th, 2011 paper where the Methodist Church said, well, he's not really fired, he's just been reassigned. But in the theological world, that's called getting fired. <laughs> this congregation tested everything. They knew the word of God well enough to know that the pastor was giving a counterfeit message. They held on to the good word of God, and they got rid of the bad pastor. More recently, Gary Schultz told me that the Jehovah Witnesses stopped by the Outer Limits Youth Center and Gary said to them, if I walked into one of your kingdom halls and I asked you, what is the way for me to experience salvation, what would you tell me? Jehovah Witness says, well, believe in Jehovah, believe in Jesus, undergo Jehovah Witness baptism, and then you got to obey, you got to do good, you got to put in a certain number of hours a month going door to door. You have to be a good Jehovah Witness, a good pioneer and publisher of the kingdom. But Gary Schultz is one of those guys who tests everything and holds on to the good. And he says, you're preaching a counterfeit gospel. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, we're saved by grace through faith. And this is not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, so that nobody should boast. We're not to do good works in order to earn our salvation. We do good works out of appreciation for the salvation we've already experienced through faith in Jesus Christ. You're preaching a false message. 
Then the Jehovah Witnesses said to him, when could we come back and visit you again? <laughs> <laughs> that, that's what it means to test everything. To not ignore everything you hear, but to filter everything you hear with what you know the word of God to teach accurately. And we need to do the same thing in our day with contemporary social issues. It astonishes me how often we're willing to swallow hook, line, and sinker, whatever they say on the media or on social media, simply because it sounds good, not even bothering to take the time to see whether or not it is scriptural. Let's say you read the article on Facebook about the terminally ill woman who plans to commit assisted suicide on November 1st. The first thing you need to do is you need to sympathize with her. Cancer is a terrible, terrible thing. I don't consider myself a hateful person, but I don't think it's wrong for me to say I hate cancer. It's an awful thing. I don't blame this lady one minute for not wanting to go through it or not wanting to deal with it. I'm not judging her. I, I totally get it. It's an awful thing. But the second thing we need to ask is what does the Bible say about assisted suicide? And that's the question we're not asking enough. So you go on Google, you can use your iPad or you can use a, a smartphone. What does the Bible say about assisted suicide? And then you're going to find a link to openbible.info, which is going to list nine verses dealing with the subject of assisted suicide. You're going to read about the sad suicides of King Saul in 1 Samuel 31, the suicide of Judas in Matthew chapter 27. You'll read Exodus 20, verse 13, you shall not murder. You'll read 1 Corinthians 3, 17, if anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. You'll also read 1 Corinthians 6, 19, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own, you were bought with a price, therefore honor God with your body. And then you'll read a couple verses about the biblical view of suffering. Romans 5, 3, suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. And then you'll read 1 Peter 4, 19, which says, So then those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. It doesn't say those who suffer according to God's will should throw in the towel, give up, and commit assisted suicide. It says go to the Lord. It says pray to him. And then you realize that ending your own life is not the way to deal with suffering. Instead, we go to God, because in the last days of our lives, maybe he has a message for us before we go. Maybe he has a ministry for us before we go. Maybe there are people he wants us to talk to, or apologize to, or pray for. Or maybe we're going to end up living a whole lot longer and a whole lot better than what the doctor said, because don't you know that sometimes doctors are not right? King Hezekiah was terminally ill in Isaiah 38. The prophet Isaiah said, put your house in order. You're not going to recover from this illness. And instead of King Hezekiah saying, well, I think I'm going to call my doctor and take a lethal drug and commit assisted suicide, he turned his face to the wall and he prayed. He said, Lord, remember me. Remember the stuff I did for you while I was alive. And then the word of the Lord came to Isaiah and he said to tell the king, I have heard your prayer and seen your tears, I'm going to add 15 years to your life. So you never know what God has in mind during those last days. So instead of pontificating like God or playing God or doing something like that, we need to start praying to God and trusting God with our lives. Well, you say, well, Pastor Mark, what if the person is only being kept alive by machines? Is it a sin to pull the plug? Well, long story short, no, it's not. That person is already one foot in eternity and you're just acknowledging that that is God's plan for the situation. Well, you say, Pastor Mark, what if the person is terminally ill? They're weak, they're bedridden, they've decided they're not hungry, they don't want to eat anything, they've decided they don't want to take medicine, is that a sin, is that euthanasia, what should I do? I think you need to leave that between the person and God. I haven't found any Bible verses that say, Thou shalt take chemotherapy for six weeks or else. I mean, that's not in there. 
And I don't think it says, thou shalt drink three heaving bowls of homemade chicken noodle soup, whether you're hungry or not, because this is the will of God in Christ Jesus. It's not there. I think in a situation like that, when you are declining and you're weak, it's okay to be in your bed and pray to the Lord and take some palliative care pain medication and look to God and cry out to him and say, Lord, I'm asking for an earthly healing or I'm asking for an eternal healing, but I'm not going to play God. I'm going to let you be God, and you pick the time. I just pray for wisdom and strength. Testing everything and holding on to the good obviously means we need to become more familiar with the Bible. And if you read the Bible 15 minutes a day, you're going to get through the Bible in a little less than a year. Well, you say, Pastor Mark, now you're making me feel guilty. I know I'm supposed to read the Bible. I don't disagree with that. But I have a hard time understanding the Bible. When I do get around to reading the Bible, I don't get what the Bible is saying. So I feel helpless. What do I do? I have two prescriptions I want to give for that. Number one, I recommend you purchasing the NIV Life Application Study Bible. We use it all the time in Sunday school and in Bible study class. It's got verse by verse notes at the bottom that bring clarity to cloudy passages. If you don't own one, get one. It is worth every penny. The second thing you might try is to switch things up and try a different translation of the Bible. The NIV is always going to be my favorite translation. I've been reading it for 29 years. It is what it is. I'm not going to change at this point. But another translation I really like is the contemporary English version, the 21st century translation of the Bible. It's written in easy to understand English. When I'm having days when the Bible is dry and I'm having trouble and I'm struggling, I'll switch over to the CEV and it's like drinking ice cold water on a hot sunny day. It is really, really refreshing. And it's good to have more than one translation of the Bible around the house anyway. I recommend you picking up a CEV Bible. Proverbs 23, 23 says, buy the truth and do not sell it. Though it cost you everything you have, gain wisdom. It might cost you $80 for a study Bible and a Bible dictionary. It might cost you half an hour of your time for study and for prayer. It might require changing your positions on certain social or theological issues that are not in line with what scripture teaches. It might mean repenting of a pesky sin that's keeping you from the full blessing of the Lord. But whatever it costs, the truth of God is worth it. Do not buy the lies of assisted suicide. Do not buy into same-sex marriage. Do not buy into the lie that says it's okay for me to believe whatever I want to believe and still call myself a Christian in good standing. Buy the truth and do not sell it. Though it cost you everything you have, gain wisdom. Find the good stuff and hold on to that. And then verse 22 says, avoid every kind of evil. You know, the best way to do that is to turn your life completely over to Jesus Christ. The word repent means to change your mind or change your direction. And you have to say, Lord, I want to turn away from the bad stuff, and I want to turn to the good stuff. I want to turn to you. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Make me the kind of person you created me to be so that I, too, can become a tester of what is good. Jesus loves you. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. Amen. We'll remain seated and we'll sing number 178. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. That's the good stuff we're talking about, the word of God. Number 178.
we have any special prayer requests? Yes, Jeannie. Um, for that girl who is considering killing herself on the gun. Okay, yeah, we need to pray for Brittany Maynard, who is um, the one who is considering doing assisted suicide on November 1st. I think the scripture is clear. We live as long as we can for as best as we can, trusting God every moment and second of the way. Let us pray. And Father, we thank you for your grace and your goodness. And we live in difficult times where it's not so easy to tell the true from the counterfeit. That money I was showing the kids, it was easy because the real money was bigger. But sometimes it's not that clear cut. And that's why we need the Bible. That's why we need the scripture. That's why we need to say, let God be true and every man a liar. And so, God, I, I pray that you would give us discernment and wisdom so that we can discern what is best and be blameless and pure in the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ, in order to magnify your name for the praise of your glory. Lord, we pray for Brittany Maynard, who is um, considering this difficult decision, and we pray for her, God. We pray for intervention, and, and well, we also pray that you would give her the healing that's going to bring you the most glory in the situation. We pray for an earthly healing. She's so young, and we would love to see that. And me personally, I think that would bring you a lot of glory. Um, we pray, Lord, for grace, that most of all, she experiences the, the life of Christ. Help her to choose wisely, scripturally. Father, we also pray for those of us who are wrestling with real-world decisions. Help us, Lord, to, to hold to the tried and the true and avoid every kind of evil, just like what Paul says in this passage. And Father, we also um, pray for the Gideon's ministry. and We want to do what Al was talking about and do one of those three things and, and really lift them up and we thank you that 80 million Bibles were distributed in the last year. And may the word of God continue to go out and accomplish what you desire in people's lives. Also, God, we pray for our leaders, for the president, the Congress, the courts, the governor, and the, and the state assembly and senate, that you would give them wisdom to make wise choices and give us discernment to know who is standing up and doing what is right and who isn't. And we pray for our troops. Keep them safe, both here and around the world. Most of all, God, we thank you for Jesus, who taught us to pray the Lord's Prayer, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Remain standing for the closing song of the service. And it's a good thing we're standing up, because you can't sing Standing on the Promises when you're sitting on the premises. So we'll <laughs> sing number 181, Standing on the Promises.